So I've reviewed Doom 1, Doom 2, and Doom 2016 so far. I haven't finished Eternal just yet, but a review will be coming for that one. Still, I get the feeling I'm forgetting something. Maybe Doom 64? Ooh, maybe Doom 2 RPG? Or maybe the awkward graphics calculator port of Doom. That's quite a fascinating little... Huh? Oh, hey, Doom 3, didn't see you there. Well, while you're here, I guess it's time to tackle that awkward little middle child, so this is my review of Doom 3 for the PC. While Doom 3 is a first-person shooter, it immediately establishes itself as having a very different tone from the first two Doom games. It attempts to be a hybrid first-person shooter slash survival horror, rather than the horror just being a skin like in Doom 64. It's the only real mainline Doom game where you don't start out in the action, rather you have to go through the area quite a bit before you get your pistol. It'll be a bit further before you have any actual demons to shoot with it. While I can kinda see how this would build up the atmosphere, that isn't really how Doom operates. Some people have criticized 2016 and Eternal for being a bit slower than classic Doom, but it still takes the method of starting out with action. After at least around 15 minutes worth if you go straight there, hell does break out proper and you start shooting zombies, but there's still a persistent darkness and relatively cramped hallways throughout. Now, I've been pretty harsh so far, but really there are some good aspects of the game plan. I did play it all the way through. Your weapons, of course, start out with a fist, followed by a pistol and flashlight. The flashlight can technically be used as a melee weapon, but is basically there mainly as a means to light up the often very dark hallways. You do get the shotgun, of course, and then there's a machine gun to serve as a simple rapid fire. The chain gun is actually in the game, and is the harder hitting of the two. Unlike 2016 and Eternal, the chain gun doesn't really have any wind-up to it, so the main advantage of using the machine gun after that is if you run out of ammo. Or at least that's the case if you're only playing vanilla, but if you're playing the duct tape mod, which I would heavily recommend, it actually gives the machine gun a light. You also get hand grenades, but I never really use them myself regularly. The rocket launcher and plasma rifle are expected, but still appreciated, especially with the tougher enemies. The BFG is sorta of interesting, just firing it shoots off a fairly weak blast. You have to charge it up to make the most out of it, but overcharging it can actually kill you. Doom 3 also has a unique weapon called the Soul Cube. You actually start with it in Nightmare Mode, which you'll probably need because that mode actually constantly drains your health down to 25. Kill five demons to charge it up on soul power, and when you use it, it seeks and slays all demons nearby. It also gives you the life essence, which is a pretty way of saying it restores health. The final boss in the game actually requires it. You also get the chainsaw, but it's risky to use even against zombies. While it can cut through pretty fast, unless you're lower on ammo than health, you probably won't be risking it too often. Or at the very least, I didn't get much use out of it myself. Your enemies, like in the original Dooms, consist of a mix of possessed humans and pure demons. The most basic, of course, are zombies that try to swipe at you with a balder and bloatier variant that's more damaging. There's also pistol and shotgun firing possessed, as you would expect. Then there's, of course, commandos with chain guns. While Classic Doom also had its scan enemies, they seem much more annoying here. They're more of a bullet sponge, which means you'll be soaking up more bullets yourself, especially when you try to reload and they rush up to you. Then you've also got a unique variant of commando that have a tentacle arm that they like to whip you with. Crouching is supposed to help you dodge their attack, but I found it a tad hard to get the timing down. There are also flame zombies that rush at you much more quickly than the regular ones, and chainsaw zombies that will try to rip into you. Thankfully, as you may have guessed, they're both melee range, so just keep your distance. Imp stand as the weakest demon as always, and this actually introduces the more jumpy behavior you'd find later in 2016 in Eternal. Still not a big fan of the camera shaking that accompanies melee swings on you, though. Actually, that's a reoccurring thing in this game, and that may be one reason why the combat feels so janky. Rather than being bipedal and hunchback in their appearance, pinkies are now quadpedal with no nose or eyes, just a mouth. They can be fairly annoying in a tight space. Pop them with a shotgun or something stronger. Kakademons are basically business as usual, and Lost Souls are sort of like classic Doom ones, but can be really aggressive. The Mancubus isn't too bad to deal with, but the Revenant is just a complete headache due to its homing missiles moving faster than you. Your options are to use the Plasma Rifle to destroy them in mid-air, be near a wall corner, or embrace the pain. The Archvile is sort of a precursor to 2016 Summoner in that it summons enemies and has a fire wave attack. Hell Knights can certainly be a handful, acting as classic ones, but are at least lumbering and slow. Now for new enemies, Trite's little spiders with heads and Cherub's little baby-like demons are pretty similar. They're small, so they're harder to hit, and you generally want to spray them with a chain gun. Ticks are basically trites, but more insectoid. Maggots are very similar to pinkies in that they rush you with a melee attack. Thankfully, they're weak enough to die to one shotgun blast. Wraiths are like the other half to 2016 summoners in that they like to teleport around. 
basically just shoot them when they appear. Now there's also a few bosses you need to take care of. Spoiler alert! First up is the Valkyrie, the now cliched concept of a woman upper half to spider lower half. So just dodge and shoot, basically. Now the Guardian is a little more interesting. Completely invincible but blind and uses seekers which sort of look like the Chica larva on Metroid Prime 2. Kill all three and the Guardian exposes his blue ball to summon more of them. Shoot its big blue ball enough times until it pops and you win. Then you've got the Sabioth, a tank monster with a BFG. Don't worry, this is some lame form of BFG that has a chip in its projectile. Once you figure that out, know to shoot it, he's pretty manageable. The Cyber Demon stands as the final boss of the base game, which sadly means no Spider Mastermind. It's a real shame because there's a beta screenshot and it looks pretty badass in that. Even more disappointing is that this is actually the weakest Cyber Demon I've ever faced. Run around, kill imps to charge up the Soul Cube, fire at Cybe, rinse and repeat until dead. Thankfully, not everything here is a complete negative. The game actually has secrets like in Classic Doom to hunt down, some in the form of text or audio logs that give you a locker combination. They're typically optional, but they'll provide you with some extra gear. The Super Turbo Turkey Puncher 3 near the beginning is also pretty amusing, and you get a funny email if you play it long enough. Overall, the gameplay is okay, but in my opinion, a low point for the main series. Anyone who's critical of 2016 and Eternal being slower than Classical Doom, they should realize that Doom 3 took that to the extreme. Your slow movement speed is actually a liability against some enemies, especially the Revenant, and the game frequently halts the action for extended periods. There are some moments that can actually be pretty cool, like exploring the surface of Mars with limited oxygen, but ultimately it's conflicted. Ultimately, my main problem with it is it tries to have it both ways. What I mean by that, of course, is that it tries to be a tense survival horror while also being a high-octane first-person shooter, and the two don't blend together very well. You can't exactly both feel unstoppable and powerless at the same time. And I'm not really saying it's terrible, I even got some enjoyment out of it on its own merits. What I am saying, however, is that it's not exactly particularly good as a Doom game. Much like the first concept of Resident Evil 4 being deemed too action and becoming Devil May Cry, maybe they would have been better off making a new IP out of it, or at least a spin-off. The number in the title probably damns it more than anything else, because you have to compare it to Doom 1 and 2, and in there it falls flat in my opinion. need full access, Dr. Petruka, Delta included. I won't have any difficulties doing that, will I? Only if you get lost, Swan. Just stay out of my way. Amazing things will happen here soon. You just wait. The game's story serves as a reboot of the series of sorts. The Hell Invasion hasn't quite happened yet, but the pot is heating and is ready to boil over when you arrive. The veritable Doom guy has just arrived on Mars and has to report to Sergeant Kelly. Right off the bat, you see a guy on a waiting chair desperate to get out, encouraging you to do the same. The obvious plot structure that something's going to go horribly wrong is further extended with a cutscene on the way to Kelly's. A man named Swan from the board insists on inspecting the facility, while Petruger, who couldn't be a more obvious bad guy, eventually relents. After making it to Sergeant Kelly, he reprimands you for taking too long, even if you went straight there, and you're tasked with finding a missing scientist. Following a sentry bot, you're fitted with armor and a pistol and sent into what one of the personnel calls the dungeon. When you do find the scientist, he insists that he just needs to warn Earth before it's too late. And of course, hell breaks loose. The scientist is possessed by what looks like a classic version of the Lost Soul and turns into a zombie along with the rest of the crew, but not Doom Guy for some reason. Classic Doom kinda made sense since he came along afterwards, and 2016 makes the Slayer out to be some kind of angel-powered superhuman, but what's the reason here? In any case, Sergeant Kelly sends the order to return to HQ, but of course you stopped at every turn and have to make detours. Swan is seen with a bodyguard, Campbell, who is armed with a BFG. Sergeant Kelly wants you to send a distress signal for reinforcements, but Campbell seems to be one step ahead of you, sabotaging things. At last, you make it to a communication station, and you get to choose whether or not to listen to Sergeant Kelly and send the signal. The thing is that sending it will likely cause the demons to use them to reach Earth. Don't worry, though, because this is basically one of those Telltale-style choices in that Petruger sends the signal even if you don't. Yeah, are you so surprised that Petruger is the bad guy and is aiding in Hell's invasion? You're then chasing Petruger, quite literally through hell and back. It eventually comes to light that the UAC was utilizing portals that came about from a very ancient civilization on Mars. They proved unable to stop the hell invasion that resulted, so they created the Soul Cube with some souls of the survivors. The champion among them used it to seal the portal, but seemingly losing his life in the process. Just to make sure it doesn't get in his way, of course, Petruger actually seals the Soul Cube in hell, but the Doom Guy finds it. With Soul Cube in hand, the Doom Guy heads to the excavation site, faces off with the Cyber Demon, and kills him, and seals the Hell Portal once and for all. Or so it would seem, but Petruger is still alive and becomes one with a demon known as the Meledict. However, that's going into the DLC and I won't be discussing it here, mostly because I haven't actually played it yet. 
If there's anything I will give Doom 3 credit for, it's introducing a lot of the extra plot via logs. That was also a thing in Metroid Prime, and it's a nice way to give it depth without beating the player over the head too much. As is, the plot is very much dominant, so at least they know to make most of it optional to find. Ultimately, the plot suffices for what it is. Having the teleported technology be of Martian origin, I'm a little bit iffy about. On one hand, it's an interesting little addition, but on the other hand, I like the idea of the UAC being clever enough to come up with it on their own instead of just stealing the technology. The sinister, underhanded plot with Petruger is fine, even though it was a little too predictable. Let's face it, that guy screams bad guy the second you see him. The occultist elements were sort of interesting and clearly formed the basis for 2016's over-the-top variant of it, so that's pretty cool at least. This is definitely where I will give Doom 3 the highest praise. You can tell it's the aspect Carmack put the most effort into. The game introduces Ed Tech 4, and while it hasn't aged as well as Wolfenstein 2009 or even Quake 4, it's pretty impressive for its time. The game utilizes bump mapping with specular highlights in addition to stencil shadows, and when the settings are cranked up to their highest, which is trivial nowadays, the game holds up surprisingly well. Just don't try playing with bump mapping off, because for some reason the human heads have ugly seams right down the middle. In general, human faces stand as an Achilles heel on the aesthetic level. They certainly don't hold up as well as Half-Life 2's surprisingly lifelike faces, but they'll do. The monsters take a more gritty and realistic style than the previous Dooms, but this isn't necessarily a good thing. In the process, I feel they lost much of their charm. I honestly think many of them would work better as new monsters alongside classic designs, and 2016 and Eternal actually do this by using its Hell Knight design alongside classic parents. I've heard it said that Carmack was meticulous to the point of making sure every pipe always connects to another one. It sort of shows, since while the environments are definitely cramped, they're very well polished, too. You can see the little detailing all over the place, and there's even a nice refraction effect on glass and occasionally bathroom mirrors with full reflections. Perhaps the one area that's held up the most graphically is the surface of Mars. It's at least reasonably well lit, unlike most of the rest of the game, by Doom 3 standards, and fittingly caked with dust and more opened up. It definitely provides a very good break from the UAC's extremely cramped hallways. The Hell levels have an interesting castle-like architecture, but tend to be either as coked in darkness as the Mars base, or coated in a thick red light. Overall, I'd have to say that its Hell aesthetic is actually less pleasing than 2016's, let alone Eternal's. One thing of interest, however, is that there's fully interactive UI systems with various computers. The text actually appears to be vector-based, so it holds up even at resolutions the game was clearly never meant for. The voice acting is also pretty fine for what it is, and the sound effects and music are well done enough. Ultimately, Doom 3's presentation is the one aspect I'd say holds up the best, but mostly from a technical level. While I have to commend Carmack for pushing in Tech 4 to new technological feats, the resulting cramped and often pitch black halls and relatively dull hell design really sears it. I have to admit though, the hybrid hell elements in the base near the end were pretty damn cool, as well as the surface of Mars moments. It's just a real shame that in his obsession with making sure the presentation was technologically impressive, the gameplay kind of suffered as a result, at least in my opinion. Next stop, Site 2. Who are you? What are you doing? Overall, I have to say, Doom 3 isn't a terrible game by any means. It's an alright game on its own merits, and had enough to get me through to the end. Ultimately, I'm more disappointed than flat-out appalled. This might not seem like a fair comparison, but I'd say it's more like Duke Nukem Forever in that ultimately the survival horror aspects clash with the action shooter aspects too much, resulting in combat that feels diminished. I can see why some people say they consider Doom 64 to be the real Doom 3. It definitely feels more like a follow-up to Doom 2 and uses its horror as more of a skin than gameplay altering, and even has the story take place after Doom 2. Still, the actual Doom 3 is a decent experience if you want to see what it's all about, and you can do a lot worse. Just think of it as a spin-off game and you'll do just fine. It's definitely not a good Doom game. Set will be dispatched immediately for your safety. Have a nice day. Now entering Site 2.